I'm glad to be here. My name's Patty Webb, and I'm the new prep coordinator. I started uh, the middle of June, went through one sign-up period, and uh, now we're getting ready to really roll into what the new Farm Bill brings. Uh, I'm going to have a little disclaimer here. The information that we're going to go through today was valid for this last sign-up that we just went through. Your state folks with uh, NRCS and with the FSA right now are being trained on what the new farm bill is bringing to the CR through the CRP and the CREP practices. So what I'm going to talk about may change by the time they come back and, and give us the updates on what's new, what's changed, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm going to do is give you kind of the nuts and bolts of how I have seen this thing move um, from this last sign-up period. So as an overview of the CREP program, Delaware's implemented the Conservation Reserve, Reserve Enhancement Program to, and the goal of it is to enroll up to 10,000 acres in agriculture land in Kent, Newcastle, and Sussex counties. And the program's designed to reduce the sediment and the nutrient runoff, uh, which is adding excess nutrient enrichment to the Chesapeake Bay, the Delaware Bay, and the Delaware Inland Bays. As many of you know, CREP is a partnership, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. It involves several organizations, the USDA from the Farm Service, sta Farm Service Agency standpoint, DENREC um, representing the state, USDA again with the NRCS folks, many of you in the room, as well as the conservation districts. As, and it includes sometimes help with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Delaware Department of Agriculture with their forestry service. So the purpose of CREP is to improve the water quality, reduce soil erosion, reduce the amount of sediment and phosphorus and other pollutants that enter the waterways, as well as to improve wildlife habitat and restore the wetlands. Some of the goals for Delaware CREP are to facilitate the nutrient and sediment reduction to achieve Delaware's water quality goals. That is really the main focus of the CREP program. Also to establish buffers on 1,200 acres of state waterways and drainage systems, and to increase wildlife habitat, wildlife corridors in the various bodies of water, that being the Chesapeake Bay, the Delaware Bay, and the Delaware Bay Inlets. And finally, to restore the natural conditions for the water temperature and dissolved, dissolved oxygen in the water through riparian buffers. So what land is actually eligible for the CREP program? Well, a producer must have a minimum of 80% of their eligible land in Delaware located in either the Chesapeake Bay watershed, the Delaware Bay watershed, or the Inland Bay watershed. The land must be adjoining drainage ditches, drainage ditches, streams, or other water bodies. Now, there's, there can be um, a exception to that. If a producer wants to put in a shallow water area, a wetland restoration area in a floodplain or a non-floodplain area, they do not have to be located along a ditch or a stream. However, this land must be suitable for the practices determined by the NRCS folks. Now, the land must be in cropland or marginal pasture land from four out of six years. From this, now remember I told you this was based on this last farm bill, so the years are from 2012 to 2017, and I'm assuming by the time our folks get back from uh, getting the training on it, these years are going to be updated. The owner must own the land for 12 months, and of course, as all rules and regulations, there are exceptions to this. Uh, don't need to go through all of them, but just know that if you find a, a really great area and the owner hasn't been there for 12 months, let's check it out because they may fall under one of the exceptions. Also, land that is in marginal pas pasture land is suitable for CREP. However, it needs to go into a riparian buffer. Now, in the CREP 
uh, in the CREP practices, there are certain practices that are eligible uh, and are considered to be CREP. They are the hardwood tree planting, permanent wildlife habitat, shallow water area for wildlife, filter strips, riparian buffer, wetland restoration, and wetland restoration in a non-flood non plain. If there are any other CRP practices that they want to do, they are not classified as a CREP practice in Delaware. Other states may have <laughs> other practices, but for us, this is what we're working with right now. I just have a series of pictures here now coming up showing you some of the practices and some of the specifics that uh, the producer had to meet um, for this last sign-up period. In order to be in a CP3A, there needed to be a minimum of a 35-foot width. The cover needed to be the length of one side of a ditch stream or water. The tree species needed to meet certain specifications determined by NRCS. And if the producer wanted to put softwoods in, particularly pine, they were not allowed to exceed 20% of the trees that were planted. It's just a picture of some of the planting that's going on. Then the filter strip. The minimum average width of a filter strip was 24 to 120 feet. It needed to be the length of a water protected on that track that is being enrolled into CREP. In this picture here, it's showing the practice on either side of the stream. It doesn't, for the CREP practice, it needs to be the length of the actual stream on one side. The total acreage cannot exceed 25% of the cropland in the field, and the species that are planted in this filter strip must meet certain specifications. For the riparian forest buffer, the minimum width here had to be 35 feet. This is the riparian buffer. Again, it needed to cover the entire length of the waterway. Maximum average width of 180 feet. This is a picture of uh, two practices put together, which is allowed to happen on a tract of land that a producer owns. This is an example of uh, back behind here where you can't see, there's a stream. This is the riparian buffer, and this is an example of a filter strip. Shallow water area, which is a CP9, the total acres enrolled in CREP, and CRP together in a sign-up cannot exceed 20 acres on a track of land. The wildlife habitat, a minimum width of 35 feet, and a maximum average not to exceed 150 feet. And again, this one, entire length of the eligible ditch stream or water needed to be protected. And for the area that a wildlife habitat could encompass on a track of land was a total of 10 acres per tract or 10% of a total tract. And again, the species planted in it needed to meet the specifications according to NRCS. That means the type of grasses that could be planted the, uh, whether it needed so many wild, uh, wildflowers, uh, you know, if it needed to have clover or choice a producer wanted to put in uh, a legume. This is an example of what the re wetland restoration would look like, and I'm hoping we're going to see more about this here today, uh, the CP23 and 23A. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the monies and how some of that works. There are certain incentive payments that happen with the CREP practice. Initially, and th these, are, these are given, these are produced through the um, FSA folks, through the federal government. There's the signing incentive payment. Certain practices are eligible for a signing incentive payment. Those are the filter strips and the riparian buffers. Those are $100 an acre. For a wetland restoration uh, or wetland restoration non floodplain, that is $150 an acre. There's also a practice incentive payment. In order to put in some of these practices, the federal government will also give additional credit. 
40% of the eligible cost to install the practice, and that would be of these practices listed here. And finally, the Chesapeake Bay incentive payment. In order to receive a one-time payment, the producer needed to be enrolled or re-enrolled in the CREP practice, and the CREP practice had to be the riparian buffer, all right? And it also had to be within the Chesapeake Bay watershed or within one of the Chesapeake Bay hydrological unit codes. Also, from the federal side, there's the annual rental payment. Now that annual rental payment is based on three predominant soils that are in that practice, or in that, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the track of land that's enrolled. Or if it's marginal pasture land, that's based on the posted marginal pasture rate for the county. Then there is an incentive rate that is then the incentive race is also based on the practice and the county. Along with that, the federal government will come in and provide a cost share payment equal to 50% of the eligible reimbursement cost to install the practice. There's also a state incentive payment. And the state along with the federal payment. Now with the state, there's a one-time um, payment, it's made within the first year of the contract. The incentive payment's based on the practice in the county, and the state will come in and help with the cost share equal to 37.5% of the eligible reimbursable cost to install the practice. So again, this is a chart, if we're looking at it, it depends on what county the practice is in, what the practice is, based on what will be paid by the federal government up to this amount, the state up to this amount, and then this gives you the total that the producer would be eligible for. That's how it was calculated for this past sign-up period. So the planning sequence that we were looking at um, for this past sign-up, since I was new coming into the, uh, the CREP role, uh, if a producer was interested in putting one of these practices on their property, they'd sign up at the local farm service agency. Then FSA would determine the crop land and the ownership eligibility. Then on NRCS predetermined the practices of that eligibility. Was it the right land? Was it the right soil types in the right area? Then myself, one of the planners, will do a site visit. Then the landowners are contract, contacted by me, and planners were, were with me, or Forrester, depending on what practice we were doing. And then a planting layout, planting specifications, operations, and maintenance, and mid-contract management uh, were developed. So the dog is having some fun in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, then I would come through as the CREP coordinator with the planner, review the planning information and any expenses that would be associated and the responsibility of the landowner with the landowner along with the mid-con talk about the mid-contract management that needed to get done and any of the other agreements, we would make the call to the landowner. Then the paperwork was completed uh, by FSA, NRCS, DENREC, me, and any other specialist that was involved. The contract was approved through FSA, and then work could finally begin. So as you can see with that, there is multiple steps, multiple groups, and it all needs to be coordinated, and that's my position right now. Once the work began, the landowner needed to make sure that they signed up to be a vendor of the state of Delaware in order to receive the payment from the state. And then the landowner would receive the payments from the state in a lump sum, and the federal uh, portion of it would come through the FSA annually for the life of the contract. Now the CREP contracts would be between 10 and 15 years. 
So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And I had Phil Miller, who's part of our group, help with the slides, and he did a great job. And more to come, and we'll keep improving this. You did not get a copy of this slide presentation right now. And if, it, if, if you'd want the information, we can email it to you. But remember, it's not the most current because this is going to be updated based on what's coming out of the new farm bill that was signed um, at the end of May. So are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. Mm -hmm.